Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you so much for being here at the second installment of How Music is Made. Uh, I have two distinguished guests and friends on the dais here. This is Kate Soper, uh, whose piece Door will be presented tonight. And then, of course, everyone knows uh, Richard Festinger, a, 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 a staple of the Bay Area music scene, a composer with enormous distinction and a, f and a very, very good friend of the San Francisco contemporary music players over the years. Kate, I'd, I'd like to start with you. This is not a new piece for, for you, and you have not only heard it often before, but you've sung it often before. So what is it like to go from a context of being on the inside of music to being in, on the outside of music and coaching and hearing, it, uh, hearing other people sing and play it? Uh, yeah, well, it's a totally different experience. So this piece of mine, Door, uh, actually, I have kind of a soft spot in my heart for it because it was the first piece that I sang as a kind of a concert new music soprano. I, I did not have a vocal um, training. I had a vocal background as kind of a singer-songwriter and various other things. Um, less savory in the upstanding music community. Um, but uh, when I uh, moved to New York to start grad school at Columbia, I, I really wanted to push myself. I wanted to engage in my music as a performer. So um, it's interesting hearing this piece now because it has some things that I don't think I would write today as now a, a much more experienced uh, singer composer who has had years of lessons at this point. Um, it sort of sits in an oddly uh, middle range for the soprano, because I think I was still sort of working out the highs and the lows. There's uh, uh, plenty of kind of effects in it, and it's for a very um, strange instrumentation, uh, which are basically just um, the people who were my friends in New York at the time who would put this piece on with me. So it's for soprano, flute, saxophone, accordion, and electric guitar, which, uh, am I missing anyone? That's it, right? Yes. Um, which actually was a great orchestration to play with, and there's a lot of um, kind of beautiful moments to find in there. But I'm I'm just so thrilled that um, this piece is being played again because I kind of thought, well, strange vocal part, wackadoo instrumentation. Glad I had that experience. I sang it a few times. It's on the first uh, album of my ensemble that uh, did it with me. Uh, but hearing it from the outside now, almost 10 years later, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. It's thrilling. It's much easier as a composer, of course, to fine tune when you're not in the midst of it. So that's a real advantage. And then I think um, while, of course, every instrumentalist has a very different sound and that can be profound, vocalists, there's just something about um, the embodiment of that instrument where it's just really different depending on the singer. So it's been really wonderful to hear Amy bring a, a completely different um, set of colors and kind of interpretation to it, which is wonderful and which I would not have been able to do being a different person. So yeah, it's, it's, it's nothing but good, really rewarding and very interesting. Well, actually, one of the things about instrumentation, and this applies to both of your pieces, w w was that the, fa the fascinating thing, the attractive thing to us as the presenter of this concert was that these are instrumentations that step outside a kind of, of, of norm, in fact, yes, that you don't he see standardized instrumentation, standardized ensembles for electric guitar, tenor sax, uh, accordion, and flute, and soprano, but that's its, that's its appeal. So one more quick question to you. Do you. Can you think of a couple of surprises? Because as you said, you worked this out with your, with your bandmates. Uh -huh. I mean, what were the surprises in rehearsal as you heard these sounds, which you probably we're hearing for the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think some of the surprises were just how um, well a lot of it worked. So, you know, maybe it should be a standard instrumentation, but I think in particular, the delicacy of the electric guitar, which you don't often think about, um, but how, how uh, just how it can shimmer and how it can add a, a kind of, I don't know, just, just something very subtle, which you wouldn't think of. It's the only amplified instrument on stage. And then, um, the accordion, I guess, uh, maybe it wasn't a surprise, but that just adds such a kind of richness that I just wasn't, hadn't really been used to working with. Um, and then I think, um, yeah, I don't know, just, just sort of, uh, I guess, the way that they, that the instrument and the, the two winds together with those two instruments, just, just how surprisingly easy it was to find blend in a lot of different kinds of textures. So everyone could make some kind of noisy, quiet thing, and everyone could make kind of a voluptuous, melodic thing. So um, just looking for ways to find um, commonalities and being surprised at how 
how uh, easy that was, actually. Yeah, and the commonality is so interesting because, I mean, one of the lessons in working on it in, in rehearsal this week is that, well, first of all, the flute makes friends with everybody. So you find love a way. Love the flute. <laughs> yeah. Love the flute. The, the flute is the kind of connective material in a way because it can, it can play with the upper register of the accordion in a way where you're not even quite sure who's playing what. It has the ability through key clicks and noises to talk to the tenor saxophone. It, there's a gorgeous moment with the guitar harmonic and, and the, the flute whistle tone, or practically whistle tone. And uh, so you, you, you find, in, in fact, that the, the, the flute is a sort of ambassador in this, in this yeah, context. I like that. Yeah. Richard, let me ask you uh, uh, similar questions. What is the relationship with the composer and the potentially frightening aspect of the blank page in front of him or her? How did this begin for you? Well, uh, one learns not to be too frightened of the blank page, or, <laughs> or one wouldn't get very far. Uh, well, it does go back to those conversations. Uh, we had several conversations that often turned around uh, instrumentation. Uh, what what would what would the ensemble be, and uh, and in the end, uh, it, uh, it it kind of came to me ra rather suddenly that uh, that if I was going to write for this size ensemble, which is uh, what six instruments plus voice, uh, which I and I'd written f a, a good deal of music for ensembles this size, uh, that I would like to have voice in it. And um, that, of course, is a, is a defining moment because the next step is uh, that is the search for texts, um, and uh, that was um, a certain period of my life when I about three weeks when I did nothing but read poetry for sixteen or eighteen hours a day and uh, discovered uh, the very wonderful poetry of uh, Alicia Elspeth Stallings. Uh, and as soon as I read, uh, as soon as I discovered the first uh, poem, which uh, you um, which I set in this piece, uh, I knew I wanted immediately that I wanted to set that poem, uh, and then it was a matter of finding uh, other poems. So that's r that's really the genesis of the piece: is the decision to use the voice, and then uh, the um, the choosing of the texts. And did did the choices of instrumentation of the instrumental ensemble itself? In what way did they were they related to text, or was that um, was th I mean I'm thinking in particular of the horn, yeah. which is a little bit the outlier in the on, in ensemble. And, I mean it isn't in any real way because the horn be belongs beautifully in this ensemble. But if you were to say which of these instruments would you not necessarily expect to see, that would probably be the one. So what about the horn? Well, that's why it's there, <laughs> because um, because I didn't want to. I mean, there's so many there are, uh, large numbers of pieces being written for strings with a complement of flute and clarinet and piano and perhaps percussion, and uh, you know I wanted something. I wanted a little bit different sound, and and I felt that the, the incorporation of the horn uh, would give me that uh, that, that very rich. Um, the richness and the sound of the brass that's not qu as brassy as trombone or trumpet, obviously, uh, but, it, but it really gives the ensemble a very different sound. Uh, and, the, and the horn, in fact, um, in this piece, uh, also true of the clarinet, they have a more of a soloistic sort of role. They're often, they often uh, are featured when the, when the baritone is not singing. Yeah, and then it also serves the purpose, along with the fact that it's not just clarinet, but, but frequently bass clarinet, with male voice of essentially lowering the center of gravity of the piece and forcing us as listeners, and in, in fact, 
as working musicians rehearsing this piece to figure out a way to unveil it in, in, in some ways. I think that's a, that was a fascinating aspect of the work phase for me, at least. The, the, the general low register of the piece. Yeah. General low mm -hmm. register yeah. of the piece and the, and the question of whether, of how one addresses that because it's not simply a question of, of asking when those registers collect around the, the, re the, the resonance of the voice. It's not simply a question of asking the singer to sing louder because that doesn't really solve the problem. What, you, what we ended up needing to do was to create a certain kind of elasticity in the instrumentation so that at moments there were these windows that allowed the singer to come forward and the text to be projected. Yeah, of course, and th that's part of my job too as the composer to, to lighten the texture when the baritone is singing, and then uh, and then the instruments when the when the baritone is busy breathing or <laughs> when there's a space a space to observe the structure of the poem, then uh, then the instruments uh, come forward to fill that gap. I had written uh, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, a piece for cello and bass clarinet, which is a very interesting project, and part of the challenge of that project was finding ways to use those instruments together at the same time and in the very lowest part of their range. And this was, I thought, uh, very interesting. And there's some aspects of that in this piece. But the, the timbre of the voice is really so different and so much richer that, that it, uh, you know, it has its way of cutting through and projecting through uh, in spite of the, it's really the first movement that's, that's so low. The other movements right. have, have a higher tessitura. Kate, in, in, in your treatment of the voice, we hear also the parts of words, you know, the S's and, and words that are formed kind of before our ears and everything like that. Did, th did this come out, did the vocal treatment come out of your instrumental uh, ensemble as well? Uh, did the vocal treatment... In other words, this use of the voice uh -huh. in those ways where we hear the, right. the, the sibilance uh -huh, and the noises, uh -huh, uh -huh. was that a result of the choice of instruments? Oh, in um, I think that actually came... Um, Partly from the poetry and then partly just from my own interest as a vocalist and a composer in um, just getting to the roots of this mechanism that I'm using right now and what it can do and the sounds that it can make. Um, but the, the poems that I said are by Martha Collins and uh, it's interesting hearing uh, Richard, you talk about, you know, having the uh, the instrumentation or the, the project in mind and then searching for the poems because for me, um, usually I find a poem and it just kind of like hits me in the face and I, uh, and then a project emerges. So I was just thumbing through a book um, in a Paris Review in some bookstore and found uh, these texts that are very sparse and seemed to me to be about words themselves and even uh, to be actually about the sounds of the words. So that just kind of um, gave me a lot of cues to think about that um, in terms of setting the poetry. And then uh, in terms of the instrumentation and more to your question, um, it is, also just sort of fun and interesting to tease out the parts of words that can sound more like instrumental gestures. So the fricatives and the consonants and that kind of thing. Uh, so can you talk about the things that came after? What was what ground was paved by door? Yeah, well, it's actually interesting. Um, I, I, I think a lot about um, vocal music and the relationship of the voice to uh, the other instruments and to the world. And um, just hearing you rattle off kind of the things that the voice can do, emotional content, X, Y, Z. I think something that's sort of interesting for me with this piece is that it, because I I had a, I was sort of a burgeoning vocalist and I didn't really have all of the kind of range and expressivity that um, that the singers tonight have actually I wasn't thinking so much of the as the vo of the voice as having character and emotion and kind of having this sort of ethos that um, you think of when you see a vocalist walk on stage. So I think since then, as I've developed as a vocalist, my music has become, my vocal music has become more direct in that way and more emotionally engaged, which I've ended up finding for myself a little 
problematic because once you say that, okay, now the vocalist is is giving emotion, you have to say, well, okay, does that mean that the vocalist is lying? Or, what, you know, what does it mean that one of the people on stage here has that privilege, but the horn player doesn't have it or the electric guitar doesn't have it? So it's been interesting for me because I've started to explore that itself in my vocal music, but Door, this piece now seems to me to be from some kind of pure time when... I really was just thinking about sounds and about these beautiful, pure poems and um, just sort of about what I could do with my kind of um, sort of small voice at the time. So it, it does sort of seem like it, it set me off on something that um, has now kind of grown into something more complex and interesting, but not necessarily better. Are we hearing, at least within your, your two pieces, a concert of American music? How do you identify that way? Is, is such a concept, right, a, a valid one in, in the world today? Okay, well, I'll go out on a limb here. Um, I, I, um, I, un I know that there has been, over a fairly long period of time, in certain people's minds, a search for some kind of authentic American music. Um, I don't consider myself or my music part of that. Uh, I have for a very long time had a more international perspective, um, and that's my answer. Um, yeah, well, that's something that I think about sometimes. Um, I uh, I just was remembering once I was um, I went to grad school at Columbia, which also kind of fancies itself to have an international engagement, and um, most of the people in my generation who I collaborate with or, or in my community tend to write sort of international-looking music. And then I just remembered being in a cab somewhere with a composer friend of mine who was Finnish, and he mentioned something about how I wrote Americana, and I was just like appalled <laughs> in a very grad student kind of way. But uh, but then kind of thought about because he really didn't mean it as an insult. And then I think I, I I'm trying to think sometimes now about um, okay what it means to be an American artist or to have an American voice, and um, I think there might be a way um, to kind of. Uh, I don't know, to, to engage in something that um, might feel American without having even aesthetic connotations. And uh, I think that's something that I'm interested in exploring and thinking about. Um, almost more just in terms of recently also having conversations with other artists about, okay, what does it mean to be a, an American, you know, today of all days or, or this year? And what does it mean to be an artist um, facing something and thinking about something and thinking it through? And maybe just that process of being an artist, living in a country, um, having an experience with those two facts that inevitably means that there's some connection. Richard, you've not heard your piece in concert before. Kate, you've heard your piece in concert and normally you're singing it, so these are two kind of new experiences. What was the biggest surprise? Um, well, from the gut, from the gut. Okay, because then I thought maybe I shouldn't say this, but I did have a feeling of like, oh, I wish I was singing, just because I, I love that experience, but and not because I'm not you know in love with Amy's voice, which is just gorgeous, uh, but just sort of realizing like, oh yeah, once you kind of open that can of worms, there there is now like a little part of me that's like, but that's my part. Yeah, um, right. And so. there's a there's a cage shaped space in yeah, that. Piece, yeah, I guess right? so. Which is you know <laughs> being overfilled by Amy. But yeah, so that was kind that's of. That's a surprise. great answer, Richard. What was surprising? You? Surprise. Um, I'm not sure how to answer that. Um, I'm, I, mean, I have a very, very clear sonic image of, of the piece in my mind b before I, you know, before we started working, and so really the rehearsal process for me is a matter of um, of tr of trying to impose that. <laughs> although although I realize how important it is also for the performers to find their own uh, expressivity in it. Um, so, uh, and, and that is, I guess that is, w turns out to be surprising to me when um, it, the other, other musicians' uh, responses in performing my music. That's, that can be very interesting and wonderful because if, if a piece of music doesn't have room for interpretation for the performers to find something for themselves in it, then they're not going to play it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. And thank you to our guests, Kate Soper, Richard Festinger, and, uh, and we really appreciate your sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you, and we'll look Thanks. forward to tonight. <laughs>